Design Strategies for Transformative Innovation What can we learn from nature's designs for sustainability? How does nature's way contrast with the industrial designs? What do nature's way imply for transformative innovation for sustainability? These are the questions that we'll look at in this video. Another approach to reducing the impact of a design is to eliminate risk. Risk is defined as the product of hazard and exposure. In a strategy of eliminating risk, either the exposure is eliminated or the hazard is eliminated through an inherently benign design. To consider how a design could be benign, we look to nature as natural systems are inherently benign. Nature's designs use few elements, mainly carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. These nutrients are readily available in abundance from air, water, and soil. By contrast, man-made systems use most of the periodic table of elements. The elements in the man-made system are primarily stored in the Earth's crust in diluted concentrations and non-useful chemical forms. As a consequence, obtaining them requires processes that physically degrade ecosystems and require a large expense of energy and water. Nature's designs are cyclic. This means that, as in the example of the carbon cycle, materials are used and reused in a balanced cycle. In contrast, human systems are linear, meaning they are designed to achieve a one-way goal such as extracting energy. They do not account for the unintended consequences of achieving this goal, which is the accumulation of byproducts in another part of the system. In natural systems, subsystems have evolved that use the waste from one part of the process as a food. In the simple example of the carbon cycle, we know that humans exhale carbon dioxide, which is food for plants. Plants exhale oxygen, which is food for animals. Industrial systems, on the whole, lack subsystems that use the waste streams. So natural systems have closed-loop processes. Each subsystem provides sustenance for the other. Industrial systems have waste systems that are toxic and destructive to the sources on which it depends. For example, the current process of refining aluminum from its ore results in gaseous emissions to the air that become acid rain in the local region. The acid rain is toxic to life forms. In the natural system, the indicator of well-being is equilibrium in the system. In industrial systems, the presumed indicator of well-being is growth. People have come to question whether growth is a valid indicator of well-being. For example, an organization called Facing the Future is considering different measures of well-being. The traditional measure of well-being in the United States is the gross domestic product, which measures the total flows of money in a domestic economy. The genuine progress indicator accounts for the negative impacts of pollution, crime, financial debt, and loss of natural habitats by subtracting the costs associated with these negative impacts from the GDP. When we compare the genuine progress indicator to the gross domestic product in the United States, we see that while the GDP is generally growing over time, the genuine progress indicator shows a decrease. So, in comparing natural systems and industrial systems, we see two very different approaches and consequences. How might we do things differently in the industrial system? This begins with recognizing that we cannot solve problems with the same level of thinking that created the problem. Design strategies that use the life cycle assessment methods usually focus on changes in the domain of physical things, such as materials and processes, which is within the same industrial level thinking of using the earth and its bounty as objects to be manipulated for our use. In other words, one view is to consider all of nature as a means to an end. This is the same level of thinking that created the problem in the first place. Another set of strategies focuses on the connection or relationship between the means and the ends. What is the connection between the design and what I'm trying to achieve? In this set of strategies, the ultimate ends are the whole system well-being, and the system boundary is expanded to encompass a wider set of options, or means, by which to achieve the ultimate ends. While this is presented as a simple idea, its practice is not simple because it requires us to work with people of differing viewpoints and values to collaborate and innovate. Perhaps this attention to relationships is a new level of thinking that will enable us to solve problems that were created by the old level of thinking. Natural systems make use of a few elements, while industrial systems rely on most of the known elements. 
in natural systems, subsystems have evolved so that the waste of one process is the food of another. They are cyclic. Industrial systems produce waste that is toxic to the systems it is supporting. They are linear. The indicator of well-being in natural systems is balance, while typical indicators for industrial systems is growth. Our hope in innovating alternatives to the industrial system may be in shifting our focus to design strategies that are based on our connection to one another and to the planet on which we depend.